Hi everyone, my name is Saran Jambi Kiburu. I am Kenyan. I currently live in Sweden where I work as a developer advocate at Spotify. My team is responsible for Spotify for developers, which is one of the things I'll talk to you about today. Um, the topic of my short talk is feedback cycles and their role in improving overall developer experiences. So we'll talk a bit about uh, Spotify for developers, which is a developer portal my team and I are responsible for. We'll talk about the value of adoption um, and lay the ground for uh, discussions about developer journeys um, and their role in the work of developer experience and also um, in determining feedback modes and feedback cycles that serve the communities that you work with. All right, so Spotify for developers is this uh, developer portal that Spotify has where we put out most of the public APIs that we want our third party developer audience and our partners to use to expand the extend the Spotify experience um, in the unique contexts that they work in um, and in the communities and, and for the ideas that the communities that they serve have. Uh, we try to not be a bottleneck for all the incredible ideas that people have for what should be on Spotify. And so the developer portal is a really good way to empower people to just extend these experiences as they like. Um, this incredible group of eight people um, is responsible for everything you find on the developer portal, which is developer.spotify.com. I feel very lucky to work with these people every day. Um, so <clears throat> most of these public APIs you have heard of, the web API is arguably the most um, popular of them all. And a lot of the applications that we see our community build are based on the web API. There's also SDKs and libraries in there uh, that people are able to use. And I encourage you to look at them. One of the um, most exciting pieces of work that has come out most recently on the developer portal is um, guidelines to help a developer community um, consider the question of accessibility and make it core to the applications that they build. Um, so we have accessibility guides there for developers as well. Um, please take a look at them and use them um, whenever you are able to. So let's talk about the value of adoption. Um, for a long time in the world, we've had that imitation is the finest form of flattery, and this likely works well um, for everyone else in many different fields. But at wager in tech, and particularly in our use case, um, as we build, design, develop, maintain APIs, um, imitation doesn't work quite as well. Um, what we are trying to do is empower myriads of people to do as many different things with the APIs that we set up as possible. And so adoption surely has to be the finest form of flattery in this case. What does um, adoption look like for the APIs we put out at Spotify? Um, most recently in December, I think, uh, Instafest is an app that went viral in December. We put out Spotify Wrapped as Spotify. And um, some people in the community set out and built in Instafest app, which looks at your listenership throughout the year and then takes your most popular artists um, from your ear and puts them up on a poster. So you're able to see if you are going to go on a personal concert, um, who will feature in your, <laughs> in your festival, so to speak. It's really fun. Uh, one of my favorite ones to talk about is every noise at once because um, I find it a really a unique use of our APIs. It borrows all the data about the genres of music that we have at Spotify. Um, and I'll give you a second to guess how many there are before I tell you. And then it puts them on a page and you keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, <laughs> which will give you an idea of how many there are. Um, <clears throat> and if you click on either one of the ones listed on there, you're able to get um, sample music that, that lets you know what what a genre what, what that genre sounds like um so if you guessed anything between 5000 and 6000 you're actually right there's about just under 6000 genres of music listed there and this list gets updated every so often so take a look at that 
um, and there's many others, but in the interest of time, I will skip them and let's talk about developer journeys um, in our quest towards talking about feedback cycles. So um, you have um, for your developer portal, which will likely have APIs and maybe other things, libraries in our case, SDKs, um, you will have um, a couple of personas you've identified who will want to come onto your portal and do completely different things at any given time. They want to be able to understand what it is you're offering and make decisions about whether this is right for them to use or if they should use a competing product or API. Um, if it's developers, they're curious about a thing, they probably want to experiment. Um, and so in the case of developers, which will arguably, who will arguably be one of the key personas that you consider at any given time, for the API you're designing, the portal that you have, it is important to spend a lot of time uh, on the question, what are the myriad of ways that these developers will perceive and use tech resources out there, not just yours, but how do they use platforms that are out there in the ether, tools, documentation, how do they interact in communities where they they convene in <clears throat> what kinds of conversations do they have in there what do they complain about what are they excited about at any given time and once you understand these developer journeys that people go through and how they use the platforms the tools the documentation the communities and opportunities available to them then you're able to know how best to design your apis and to design the artifacts that you're putting out so that at any point you're sure that if they find and want to adopt your API, then it fits into the developer workflow, maybe as neatly as possible. Um, so they don't need to learn entirely new mental models before they are able to dive into your thing and then use it and adopt it. Um, so developer journeys are really important to spend time on um, before you're able to design experiences that are excellent for your developer. So let's talk about developer experience briefly. Um, so I am a developer advocate. It's one of the uh, many, many roles um, under the umbrella of developer relations. Um, and in their book, um, Developer Relations, How to Build and Grow a Successful Developer Program, um, Caroline Luca and James Parton actually have these books. <laughs> I keep referring to it quite a bit and I highly recommend it. Um, so they, they describe the role of developer experience as sitting right between where community is and where developer engagement happens um, and developer education itself. So the role of developer experience um, to me is to essentially ask yourself, there's a developer community, uh, which is a major persona that any of the resources we put out to, put out to our developer portal uh, will be accessed by these people. So how can we um, think about all the pain points that they might potentially have, or they're already facing if it's an existing resource and, and fix that for them? Um, and so in this book, Carolyn and James talk about um, the facets of developer experience as um, including awareness, right? So how do we make people aware that there's a thing we've built for them that they can use? And once they are aware about it, how do we pick their interest enough that we are able to onboard them to start to experiment and use the tool, so activate their use. And once they've started to use it, um, to experiment with it and to use it, how do we keep their engagement going, right? So they built um, a thing with version one of our thing. When things change, how do we keep them engaged? How do we find out what's important to them? How do we find out, um, you know, like where they'd like this to go, if at all, right? And that feeds into retention because if I came to use your platform 10 years ago, um, the same reasons that brought me there 10 years ago are not the same ones that will keep me here right now because tech changes really quickly. Um, and so if you're to retain me as a user, uh, you have to really think about 
uh, my needs, right? And 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 what I want to do and what my aspirations are in the developer workflow I have. So activation, engagement, retention, and awareness, all those go hand in hand. And you have to keep in mind that for a developer community, at any given point, you have someone who's been there a long while, probably as long as your your resource, your artifact has been around. So they are seasoned, they know it inside out, but then you also have new people discovering it every day and you have to think about them um, and also work them into, work their experience into the way that you design things. All right, so um, developer experience work um, involves a lot of, you know, feedback collection um, and, and use. Um, and so some of the facets of this work that I wanted to point out are around interfacing with community um, because they will use your thing, they will have issues or questions, they will come to you, um, they will want to understand use cases and you might want to tap into some of the other community members you have to develop key studies, um, that they might want to self-organize and collaborate um, and build out things innovatively. Um, it's really important that you recognize the work that they're doing, right? Um, and then maintain those feedback loops. They ask a thing, you respond, they share an idea, you either take it up and tell them what you've done with it or not. Um, so for this particular one, a good example I have is work I did in open source with an organization called Open Knowledge, and they had this tool called frictionlessdata.io. And one of the big things that I, <laughs> I'm still in awe of um, is we had a small team of six um, and the community was thousands of people um, and also from different, um, different fields. So people from government, civil society, journalism, um, who will use the tool in different ways. And so one of the ways this small team tried to not be a bottleneck was they published their roadmap publicly um, on GitHub and people will be able to comment on it, ask questions about it, but at all times people were aware what was going to happen uh, with the future of the tool and they were able to you know, make requests um, or give feedback to specific points. Um, and you know, so at the point when you will say no to someone, it's not possible to do a thing right now, they will understand it's because in the roadmap, we are two or three steps removed from what you will want to see. And then they will know how to recalibrate and get the thing done if they needed it sooner. And because it was open source, there's a lot of you know contributions from the community in cases where they needed things done faster. So that was really good to see. Um, documentation is also an important facet um, because it's a one way people will start to um, look at your tool if they are curious about what it does um, and the promise of it. So they will discover it, um, they will make decisions about whether or not it meets their needs. Um, and if it does, they'll use it to onboard and then adoption and all the things after. Um, we all know about standardization, and if you don't know the XKCD 927, um, it's a really good one, talks about this um, in the sense that it's really important to not set out to reinvent the wheel, um, but to adopt some of the standards that others have done, and particularly in the ways that APIs are designed and developed. We talked about um, giving your developer community the easiest possible path to learning and understanding your thing before they can start to adopt it, rather than having them learn new um, systems, mental models before they're able to adopt the thing. Um, experimentation is going to be one of the key things. So how can I see what it is your API is able to do without having to commit resources to it. So give me um, inconsequential spaces. So sandboxes, consoles, where I can run my experiments, um, show me code snippets, so I know where to start or how to, to go about things, give me tutorials and things like that. And then reference docs, um, error codes, change logs, versioning, all the detailed 
information that will make it easy or easier to use the resource you're putting out. And of course, amplify the work that people are putting out. It costs nothing. Um, it keeps our community going. It's a big part of community sustainability, particularly in spaces where people voluntarily find and use your resources. Um, it allows people to draw inspiration from others' work and to get clarity around, you know, the ways that a thing can be used. Um, yeah, so those are some of the facets of develop experience work. So yes, you're looking to resolve pain points, but at the heart of things, you're looking to make to make things as seamless as possible um, so that people in their developer journeys have what we call a self-serve experience. I'm able to get into unfamiliar territory, find my way around, um, pick everything I need and actually win quickly and then move away or continue with my workflow and with as minimal interaction with the team responsible as possible unless I really want to interact with them. All right. And so we're at the point where I wanted us to be, trying to move as fast as possible. Um, so feedback. We already know that the role of feedback um, is threefold. Uh, we want to make sure that people are able to find what they need and are happy to use it. But where they feel lost, they're able to tell you about it and, and get, you know, get unstuck um, a lot of the times people will start to experiment with a thing but then you lose them at the place where they have a question and there's no one to respond to it so unblock people um, push them on their way um, give them ideas or even just have a platform for them to um, contribute um, to to the future of your product in a way that is meaningful to them and oftentimes in a way that will contribute to more use cases and sustainability for your community and also for your tool by continued use. All right, so let's talk feedback cycles. In 2020, a few friends of mine and I wrote about feedback cycles um, in open source communities using those as an example. And this is there's a few uh, diagrams I borrowed from that um, to talk about feedback models um, in this section. So traditionally, the most common type of feedback model is a linear one. So you put out a thing and say, hey, here's a thing, and someone receives it and begins to look at it, and they use it and give you feedback. Maybe, yeah, it's good, or it's good, but where is this? It's good, but it doesn't speak to this situation, or when will it also include this and that? And you receive the feedback, and you think about, what you want to do with that feedback and then give them an outcome. So that's how we think about feedback um, a lot of the times. But this is a really strained model, if you ask me, at any of these junctures, um, feedback could fail. And if it fails, then there's miscommunication, misunderstanding, there's um, loss of trust, um, you know, time is also lost and people quickly move on to other things because tech also moves as fast. Um, and, you know, in the end, you have a thing, it's not being used or people are using it, but you're not listening to them. It's quite the frustration. And so if you ever think about feedback um, and how you should structure it or begin to structure it for your tool, um, your APIs especially, think about feedback cycles. And that means a lot of time investment, um, human um, investment as well. Um, you have to dedicate a lot of time and resource to listening to people and actively listening to them and then organizing what it is they're saying in certain ways, particularly qualitative feedback is difficult to, it's not difficult. It takes a lot of intentionality to process and put together. And so this is where the real work is, but this is also where the real reward is. Um, so you get your message, you receive it, you take action in it. Sometimes the action is not right now or the answer is no, but you always go back. You go back and clarify um, intent or what was meant by the original message. You act on it. Um, you maybe shelve it or you come back to it time and again. So it's cyclical. It never stops. Um, and there has to be ways to keep track of this, which we are not able to get into right now. 
Um, but I will say it takes dedicated resource, um, people talking to your community actively, um, people um, responding to them actively, and people advocating for the needs of your users actively. Um, so there's many modes by which you can listen intently, actively advocate for your users. Um, interviews are a good way to hear what it is people are experiencing and need your help with or they love or do not like about your tool. But this doesn't scale well because I can only sit with as many people in a day. And if I'm sitting with them, I'm actually not working on the feedback, right? Um, so this takes a lot of maybe man time um, and is not very efficient. And so if you wanted to scale it, one thing we do at, at Spotify is office hours and the more intentional, well, the more intensive developer days, which is where we have meetups a couple of hours, invite people to come and sit with us in a given city and to tell us about the experiences. Um, you know, we walk through some of the issues they have, give them support, um, or if it's online, it's the same format, just online. But this is also, much as it can reach more people, it's also just periodic, right? And there's a lot of downtime between meeting, you know, people from one meetup to the next. And so a, a really good thing that works um, is setting up asynchronous feedback channels. I'm working on your thing right now. I'm experimenting right now. If it feels, I know that there is a dedicated space I can come and ask questions. Um, we have a really active forum um, in our developer community. It's grown organically. A lot of the times people will ask questions and others in the community will answer them. And so we are, uh, while we are involved, we don't always have to be there for someone to be unstuck. And some of these have evolved into collaborations. There's a lot of peer mentorship that happens in there. And so feedback channels are a really good way for community to hear from one another, hear from you, self-organize um, as they go along. And as your community grows, then you also want to make sure you're not missing them at any point or, you know, you're not just leaving them to their own devices. A really big part of community sustainability that's dependent on how you set up your feedback cycles, how you set up your feedback networks um, is also empowering the people that use your resources to be able to stand up for themselves and speak up for themselves in an official capacity. It builds trust um, and really helps your community to keep growing, um, particularly where you have you know, beginners and learners and more seasoned um, users of your resources. Um, so one way of doing this is hiring dedicated advocates who go out into your community and listen to them and come back and advocate for their needs to your team. But another really good way, um, another really good way is to have um, is to have community councils where they they, you know, you get a few really active people in your community, um, hopefully from different parts of the world to represent other people and they're able to advocate for their own needs, speak up um, for themselves in forums where they meet with you and, and your team every so often. And that becomes a really good way to make sure the feedback cycles are maintained, but also actively acted on, right? Um, and inform the future versions, future development of, of the resources that you put out to your developer community. All right, I think I'm a bit over time. So thank you, everyone. Um, I hope we get to chat more about this either in the chat right now or later, um, wherever you're able to find me. I am Sarah Kiburu on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, some people may have wanted to ask if this was live, like, do you work on backstage? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. I do not. So my team doesn't work on backstage. Uh, Spotify for developers is a standalone um, developer portal separate from backstage. But there's a really great and able team that is responsible for backstage um, and primarily the open source uh, component of the work that we do. Yeah. So just to set up the 
uh, expectations for the panel conversation and the questions um, that um, you said you are welcoming also in the chat. Uh, on this new interface, there is um, there's at least a, a speech bubble with a question mark. Uh, uh, there are open questions also. And uh, the idea is that we're going to talk about um, those questions that come up together uh, with Kumar also. Um, so the feedback cycles are very close to your heart uh, because the other thing that was missing from the introduction uh, was that um, one of your um, strongest interests is about community uh, building and community sustainability. So I can see where that movie is, uh, plays into your heart. Yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, this was more like the teaser version of the one that you have to share. I know. I, I could speak all day, so let me know when. <laughs>